Test 8. Section 1. In this section, you'll hear a conversation between David and Claudia about their holiday trip. First, you have some time to read questions 1 to 5. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Well, Claudia, our first semester at university is almost over. Oh, I can't wait for the holidays. Oh, me too. Why don't we go somewhere far away and forget about lectures and essays and all that hard work? Sounds good to me. How about if we go to the coast? It would be great to do some swimming and surfing. The coast would be good, but... Let's look at our other options. There are the mountains. They're nice and cool at this time of year. There's also the desert, which I really enjoyed last year. What about going to Sydney? I've never been there, and they say it's a great city to visit. Well, I agree. Sydney would be good. But there are too many tourists there at this time of year, and I'd rather get away from buildings and cars. I vote for the mountains. All right, then. Let's do that. Now... We have to decide where we're going to stay and how we're going to get there. Any suggestions? Well, for places to stay, there are the usual places. Motels, hotels and youth hostels. We can go camping too. I'm afraid I'm not a very good camper. I tend to feel a bit frightened sleeping outdoors. All right, we'll forget about camping. So, what do you prefer? Well, since neither of us has a lot of money... I don't think a hotel or motel would be possible. How about a youth hostel? Oh, I'd rather not go to a youth hostel. They're cramped and noisy, and the person in the bed next to you might be a snorer. No, I think we should find a small holiday house to rent, and if we get a few more friends to join us, it will be really cheap. OK. You know, it's the first time for me to travel to the mountains. What do you suggest to take? Mosquito net, I guess. Mosquito net is useful, but I don't want to add more weight to our luggage. So the insect repellent can do, I think. Besides, aspirins are necessary and some cold cure, in case we feel sick or something like this. Do you think we need binoculars and a camera? Well, it would be a good idea to take binoculars. As to a camera, I'm not very for it. I'd rather record the scenes in my mind. You're right. What about the money? How much do you think is enough and how we should take it? I've learned from a friend about the cost. He told me that they spent about $480 for one week's tour. So I think $500 would be enough. We may need over $300 for the house. Have you got any traveller's checks? No, I haven't. But I've got a credit card oh, and a saving card. Then take the credit cards with us. It would be more convenient to pay the house fees with a credit card. Before the rest of the conversation, you have some time to read questions 6 to 10. Now listen carefully to the rest of the conversation and answer questions 6 to 10. Oh, I nearly forgot the date. How long will we have before we have to be back here on campus? Under a week, I think. We'll leave on the 14th of April and come back on the 21st, because you know we'll start to study on the 22nd. Do you know the definite locations of some holiday houses? I suppose it would be nice if we book in advance. Yes. Look at this brochure here. It says that there are several holiday houses near the mountains. I prefer the one near the woods. It's situated right across the road from the Rainforest Park. Mm, that sounds good. We can easily go to the Rainforest Park then. Do you know what else we can do there besides visiting the park? I know that many people go there for bushwalking, but you need a good pair of walking boots, of course. Are there any dangers in the bushes? Oh, I'm a little frightened. In fact, there's no need to be nervous of the bushes, provided that you treat it with respect and common sense. 
Most of the animals and wildlife are gentle and harmless. There are venomous snakes to be aware of, but really they're much more frightened of you than you are of them. The other thing is that certain plants can cause irritation if you touch them with bare skin. I see. Well, I can't wait for the coming holiday. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 2. In this section, you'll hear a programme on the city of Brisbane. First, you have some time to read questions 11 to 20. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 11 to 20. Today in our Around the World programme, Mr White is going to recommend a charming city to you, Brisbane. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Have you ever been to Brisbane? Well, if you are looking for a mild climate, a relaxed atmosphere and a lot of culture, Brisbane might be the place for you. Its sunny cafes and offshore islands attract surfers and sun lovers, but it is also the arts capital of Queensland, with many museums and art galleries. This thriving artistic setting mixes well with Brisbane's beach town atmosphere. Together these two qualities make Brisbane a very desirable place to live. No wonder since 1980 over a half a million Australians have moved here. Brisbane is now Australia's third largest city. English settlers living in Australia established Brisbane in 1842. At that time, more than a 100,000 Aboriginal Australians were living in Queensland. As the settlers discovered Queensland's resources, more and more of them moved in. Regretfully, the settlers drove the Aboriginal Australians from their lands. By 1859, Brisbane had grown into a prosperous city. In 1988, the world watched as Brisbane hosted the World Expo. This international fair showcased new technology, but it also showed off the city of Brisbane to the world. Brisbane also hosts a wide range of events year-round. In April, everyone can enjoy a few laughs at the comedy festival, and movie lovers will enjoy a film festival that takes place every August. For two weeks in September, there is an outdoor festival of the arts. In October, a music festival draws a large crowd, and in January, you can see Brisbane's most bizarre event. You may be surprised to hear that. The annual cockroach races. That's right, people really do train and race cockroaches. Brisbane's nice climate and compact design makes it easy to explore on foot. Follow the golden arrows in a footpath around the city centre. This will lead you on a tour of Brisbane's historical district. From the city centre, take a boat across the Brisbane River to Southbank. This area is popular for its bike paths, beach and weekend market. Hundreds of artists display their wares at this market. It's a great place to pick up some interesting handicrafts. Well, I think what you must be interested in is the unique native animals. Yes, you shouldn't visit Australia without seeing its trademark animals, the koala and kangaroo. The Lone Pine Koala Sanctuary has both. It is located just outside the city centre in beautiful Parkland. You can hold one of the park's 130 koalas or feed the kangaroos. Another quiet refuge from the city is Mount Kuta, about 8 kilometres from Brisbane. On a clear day, it offers spectacular views of the city. It also has hiking trails and beautiful gardens. 
Along the Brisbane River, a sunset cruise is also very relaxing. The areas around Brisbane are impressive. A coastal drive south of Brisbane will take you along the Gold Coast. This famous coastline boasts some of Australia's best beaches. Stradbroke Island is another easy day trip from Brisbane. A cliff on the island called Point Lookout offers a great view. From there, you can see dolphins swimming below. Brisbane Forest Park, to the north of Brisbane, is a great place for hiking and camping. These great getaways, along with Brisbane's own laid-back charm, make this city an ideal place to visit. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3. In this section, you'll hear two students discussing a survey they have to write as an assignment. First, you have some time to read questions 21 to 30. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 21 to 30. How is your market research project going, George? Very well, actually, Anna. I've just got the results of the survey back, and so now I have to draw some conclusions from the information I've collected. That's good. I'm still writing my questionnaire. In fact, I'm starting to panic, as the project deadline is in two weeks, and I don't seem to be making any progress at all. What is your topic? Forms of transportation in the city. What about you? I've been finding out people's attitudes to the amount of violence on television. That's interesting. What do your results show? Well, as I said, I haven't finished writing my conclusions yet, but it seems most people think there is a problem. Unfortunately, there is no real agreement on the action that needs to be taken. Nearly everyone surveyed said that there was too much violence on TV. A lot of people complain that American police serials and Chinese kung fu films are particularly violent. The main objection seems to be that, although a lot of people get shot, stabbed, decapitated and so on, films never show the consequences of this violence. Although people die and get horribly injured, nobody seems to suffer or live with the injuries. Any children watching might take the heroes of these programs as role models and copy their behaviour. So, what did most people suggest should be done? A lot of people were concerned about how these films affect children. They are particularly worried that children will try to behave like the stars. The survey shows that violent programs should be broadcast after 10pm, when most children are already in bed. There is also a significant minority of people who feel that violent films should be banned altogether. Well, how did people feel about the violence on news broadcasts? Most of the responses I have looked at have felt that violence on news broadcasts is more acceptable, as it's real. Although it's unpleasant, it is important to keep in touch with reality. Still many people thought that it would be better to restrict violent scenes to late viewing. Your survey sounds very good. How many people filled it in? I gave out 120, and I got 70 back. That's a very high rate of return. Who did you give your questionnaires to? I gave a copy to every student in my hall of residence, and a few to friends from other colleges. Don't you think that this will influence your results? How do you mean? The people in your hall of residence are all about the same age. They're all students and from similar backgrounds. Therefore, it is likely that they will have similar opinions.
Your results represent student opinion, not public opinion. So how are you going to do your research? Well, I'm going to interview my respondents in the shopping mall. What I'll do is ask people if they have five minutes to spare to answer a few questions. If they agree, I will ask them some multiple choice questions and tick off their answers on my sheet. Isn't it very difficult to ask meaningful questions using multiple choice? Yes, it is. The secret to writing a successful survey is to write simple multiple choice questions that target the information you're looking for. There, it's better to write a lot of short specific questions than longer general ones. So that's why it is taking you so long to write. Yeah, but I hope I'll be ready to start interviewing at the weekend. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. In this section, you'll hear an introduction on the adventure class. First, you have some time to read questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the conversation and answer questions 31 to 40. Welcome to Adventure Class. I'm the coordinator of the class. During the course of this morning, I hope to give you a clear idea of what we offer in our class. Before my lecture, listen to the comments on the class. Today we sailed into a group of whales. Class takes place in the middle of elephants, giraffes and hippos. Yesterday's lecture was at the Great Barrier Reef. Do these comments sound like your typical classroom? Probably not. These accounts come from students studying in adventure classes. An adventure class is a unique type of program that combines textbook learning with real-life exploration. Students and teachers travel together for a program in discovery and exploration. The class is provided by the Australian University's International Programme, aiming at promoting students' awareness of international communication and global environment. Here are three popular adventure classroom programs that are available to you, college students from the freshman to senior students. The first one is called Australia Short Program. The three-week course begins with several days in Cairns. There we hold classes on coral protection, how the corals are formed, what are their functions and what are the threats corals are facing. Students then spend the next two weeks on a study tour of Queensland. Known for its sunny beaches, rainforests and remote outback, Queensland provides a rich learning environment. The highlight of the program is the tour to the Great Barrier Reef. Activities include hiking, bird watching, and boating. By experiencing local culture up close, Students explore the connection between local people and the environment. Six semester credits are given by the Australian University's International Program, and the tuition fee is $1,950. African Safari Program is another popular class. Kenya's stunning wilderness becomes the classroom for students in the African Safari Program. The five-week course is set on the beautiful 20-acre campus of Australia International University in Nairobi. University professors combine classroom instruction with hands-on experience to teach wildlife management. In addition to classwork, students take trips to famous places such as Mount Kilimanjaro and Victoria Falls. Students also experience African culture through trips to local villages and Nairobi's city centre. But for most students, the safaris are the highlight of the course. 
The program includes three or four safaris. During each safari, participants camp outdoors for up to six days. One of the most popular destinations is the Masai Mara Game Reserve. An amazing collection of wildlife lives on the reserve. Students study elephants, zebras, giraffes, rhinos, and other exotic animals in their natural habitat. Those who take the course gain many wonderful memories and a greater appreciation for the Earth's natural resources. Students earn eight college credits for the program. The cost of tuition is four thousand nine hundred and fifty dollars. The last on the list is Sea Education Association (SEA). The SEA program is a one-of-a-kind opportunity where students live and learn aboard a tall ship. The course combines ocean research with instruction and personal experience in sailing. After careful instruction, both on shore and at sea, the participants begin practicing what they've learned. Everyone on board takes turns operating and navigating a 134-foot sailing ship. That is the most outstanding. Life at sea is non-stop, so everyone is assigned to a watch. During that time, students work in the lab, in the kitchen, on deck, or in the engine room. Each watch group includes eight people who rotate throughout a twenty-four hour schedule. They learn how to live at sea and how to work together as a team. Students can choose from three programs in different locations, each about three weeks long. College credit is awarded, and the cost is three thousand six hundred U.S. dollars. Is an adventure classroom for you? If the idea of learning through adventure interests you, you might want to apply. It would certainly be an experience you would never forget. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test.